Today's guests are Christina Fernandez Valle and Stacy Dunn. We join their conversation in the faculty lounge. Do a postdoc and come right into a faculty position, and psychologists are so were so much in demand at that time that um, you could do that. But in my field, it's like you finish your PhD, which takes you five years, and right. then off you go to do one or two postdocs. So I was lucky; I was able to postdoc at the Miami Project to Cure Paralysis at the University of Miami, mm -hmm. and um, I had as mentors the most wonderful um, couple that um, I could have ever had, Drs. Richard and Mary Bungie. And they had a longstanding uh, research laboratory at uh, University of Washington, or Washington University of St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And then they decided to move to Miami and do more translational work, trying to use Schwann cells, which are myelinating glia in the peripheral nervous system, try to develop that into use as a therapy for spinal cord injury. So they moved their whole operation to University of Miami at the same time I was finishing my PhD. So I thought, well, I could move and had offers elsewhere all across the country. I could have gone to San Diego or Oregon, San Francisco, and then I decided to stay in Miami because it was like one of the best labs. So after that, um, I was also trying to be adventurous. I could have gone maybe to like, um, there was a university in New Orleans and one in, at University of Alabama in Birmingham. And I thought, well, UCF, it has I thought it was a good match at the time because it allowed me to do my research. It was a growing university, and it was also a teaching undergraduate university. And the other positions I was looking at were all medical schools where you need to support yourself off of research grants all the time. And I thought, no, let me play it safe. You know, if something happens to my research funding, um, then I at least have a nine-month contract and I can teach. So luckily, it's been 11 years, and I haven't lost my research funding yet, and I'm still funded. And I just put in a grant for the next round to National Institutes of Health. What, what are you looking at now? Um, right now, so historically, I focused on the biology of these Schwann cells and how they develop and form myelin, which allows the nervous system to communicate. So your brain communicates to your limbs, and you can feel things from the, you know, in your skin because of the Schwann cells that sheath the axons that um, connect the brain to the, the periphery. Um, so I've studied that for a, a, more than 11 years, like 15 years. And then when I started my lab at UCF, I realized that um, the Schwann cell also has another, it's a, a pathology of the Schwann cell is that in certain diseases like neurofibromatosis type two mm -hmm. or type one, the Schwann cell, instead of making the myelin sheath, forms a tumor. And there's a very common disorder called neurofibromatosis type 1. It's about 1 in 3,000 incidence rate. And the Schwann cells there form tumors. And in NF2, they also form tumors. And in that case, they form tumors in the nerves in the ear. And I was studying cell communication pathways. So there's chains of proteins inside a cell that talk to one another and tell the cell nucleus, like the command center, what's going on outside the cell. So the cell knows when it's supposed to proliferate, make more copies of itself, or when it's supposed to stop dividing and make a myelin sheath. One of the proteins that was studying was actually mutated in this disease, and it was in the pathway I was already studying. So for the past six years, I've tried, I've spent most of my time studying what happens to the cell that causes it to become abnormal and form tumors. So this disease is the NF2 disease. First starts to manifest in children. About, you know, in the second decade of life, 10 to 15 years of age, they'll start losing hearing. And you'll go in for hearing tests and, you know, they're definitely losing hearing. And if you have an MRI done, you've got tumors behind each, in the, behind each, each ear toward mm -hmm. the brainstem. Um, and they, they're very slow-growing tumors. So hopefully, you know, you might have them until you're 20, 30, and nothing will happen. 
Other times they grow rather quickly and they can impinge on your hearing and you can become totally deaf. So, so is that treatable? It's treatable with surgery if they grow really large. Um, surgery always has, you know, the risk of causing permanent damage. Mm -hmm. And depending on where the tumor is, you have to remove the whole nerve, which leaves you totally deaf. Um, you can damage facial nerves, so you have problems in moving your facial muscles. So you can't smile, you might have trouble eating. Mm -hmm. So it's not a really, you know, it's not a, a acute disorder that's going to end your life immediately, but it's a chronic disorder that hopefully is manageable. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it does cause a lot of morbidity and quality of life goes down. There's another disorder, the NF1 disorder, which is much more disfiguring. You're talking about body image earlier. Um, this, um, it's a different genetic disorder that affects the same Schwann cell. And it causes um, tumors to form on your skin, just underneath your skin, so your whole body is covered with little bumps. bumps. It's very common, so you've probably seen a lot of mm -hmm. people where they're just, you know, just covered with bumps. And some of them are small, and some are so small you can't remove them, and so numerous you can't remove them. And some are rather large. And then, then there's some that form plexiform neurofibromas that are in deep tissue, and those can become very large and just totally disfiguring. So, and there's a little, there's some incidence of learning disabilities and other problems with blood pressure mm -hmm. and um, bones. Um, How common are these disorders? NF1 is really common. It's one in 3,000. It's the most common inhe inherited disease. Um, NF2 is less common. It's about one in 30,000 individuals, but it's more common than cystic fibrosis and muscular dystrophy put together. So it's just not recognized as one. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I'm really happy that we've been able to do in the last few years is I became a <coughs> excuse me, a board member for the Children's Tumor Foundation for the Florida chapter. And um, at the same time, the National Foundation, Children's Tumor Foundation, which used to be called the National Neurofibromatosis Foundation. But because the name was so long, they changed it to Children's Tumor. They've organized this um, national network of clinics where they want to provide a certain standard of care for individuals with NF, one and NF2, and there's a third form called schwannomatosis that's newly recognized. And then have um, clinics throughout the, the each state um, abide by or, or, or agree to abide by a certain standard of care and provide care for children and adults mm -hmm. because there's an issue with as the child grows into adulthood you many times you cannot use the same physicians you've been using throughout your life. Many times you lose your coverage for health care insurance, health insurance, and they can't get it. So they've wanted to create a series of clinics that will provide for these individuals in the, from their childhood into their adulthood. And we've been able to, in the last six months, um, nego not negotiate, but encourage two different organizations in the state of Florida to create a clinic and to make the application, the formal application to the center, to the National Center for um, Children's Tumor Foundation. And we're going to end up having probably two or more clinics that are affiliated with the National CTF that will have all the resources you need to be seen because it's so frustrating with these newly diagnosed families to find the physicians in the community that know how to first diagnose, and then what to do with the, the child after you've diagnosed that it mm -hmm. has, their, she or he has NF1 or 2. And imagine getting connected with families who are dealing with this is important too. It sounds like it could be fairly devastating for a family despite the lack of threat maybe to one's life, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you, you mentioned it's not going to necessarily kill you, but there are challenges that a lot of other people won't be able to oh, relate to. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing how these families, you know, cope when you have one special needs child with any special needs. Mm -hmm. But there's so many clinical problems. I mean, you, you get, it's, I've spoken to a lot of the families and they say, okay, we've gotten through this stage of the disease and now we're just waiting for the next one to come. And it's just, in one of the cases, one of the side or complications of NF1 is that your bone, your tibial bone, 
bows. Instead of growing straight, it bows. So it, it basically leaves you unable to walk. And in extreme cases, you, you have to, and the bone is very brittle and it keeps breaking and it doesn't heal back correctly. So many of the children just decide to have their leg amputated because trying to care for that leg is so painful, so time consuming, and so disruptive for their normal life that they now with such great prosthetics, they just amputate the leg, put on their prosthetics, and then they go and, and at least they dealt with that stage of the disease. Then they've always got the worry of one of their tumors could become a malignant tumor, which happens in about 10% of the cases in NF1 patients. So you know, the families always live kind of like, they learn to live with anxiety and accept it, but you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, there's tumors that grow in the optic nerve, mm -hmm. so it can, and also there's bony dysplasia, so the bones of the face can grow. So one side of your face can be totally beautiful, normal. The other side can have, a, you know, be deformed because of bony tumors. So you look at some of these young kids and they're like, you know, 14, 15, 16, and they're living with this. And they've got good attitudes and they're mm -hmm. like accepting of it. And then you've got, like you've been talking, right. some that look per you perfect know. and they're unhappy. And, you know, families can be so inspiring. A lot, my research oh, is in body nice. image, but all my volunteer work has been with American Cancer Societies reaching out uh, to kids with cancer. Mm -hmm. And I love that work because of my sense that they really get it about life so early to have that threat and watch the families come together because they really do know what's important. It sounds like the families who are affected by this or these diseases really have something similar in mm -hmm. that they really have to find a way to have strength to get through so many unknowns. Yeah, and it's great because you see that um, some of the families have an affected, si uh, their sibling is not affected. So there's the normal sibling and then the one that has the disorder. And it's so great to see the younger siblings or the older siblings take care of the sick one and fundraise. There was um, one of our families has a, um, an older sister that wrote a book about her younger brother and illustrated it and had it published as a fundraiser for her brother Joe. And everybody just, Joe is just this, this uh, you know, specialist, a special person and he's outgoing, friendly, and, and he actually attracts people to him that love him so much that all of a sudden they're, you know, part of the fundraising machinery and mm -hmm. they do whatever they can to, um, get c enough community involvement so that we can have these clinics, statewide clinics, because that's something I hear over and over again. You know, people call up and, I've just been diagnosed, who do I go see? And typically, you had to go to Birmingham, Alabama, or you had to go to Boston. And now? And now, you can probably stay right here in Orlando. Mm -hmm. Um, through Florida Hospital, we are working with the neuro-oncology uh, group, mm -hmm. and they put together an application, and very soon they should be um, approved, and they will be an affiliate, affiliated clinic for the Children's Tumor Foundation. That's great. How will the new med school affect your oh, career so here? Exciting. That's great. You know, when I came in 1996, I saw the promise of UCF. They had the research park. I thought this could be a research mm -hmm. triangle like in North Carolina. This could be great. Um, and it's taken a while, but it is happening. I hear the research tr park is like filled out. Um, there, I mean, it's bad for the environment. <laughs> right. I, I see, I'm in the research park and, I, and every time they come and they clear some land and the pine trees get bulldozed and they do take them away and recycle them. And then you see all the wildlife running around. You feel, you feel sad because it was such a serene mm -hmm. area. But you know, I guess that's the price of progress. Development. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But now they're building the medical school not on campus. They're building it down in Lake Nona. So it's going to be the medical city. So we have the medical school building going up eventually. We've already started with the biomolecular science building, which is a four-story building or five-story building just for research, biomedical research. And the amazing thing is that we're building this new four-story building, and it's not big enough for the faculty right. we have. <laughs> it's, they need more space, so we're probably going to have to split our faculty and have 
half of us stay on campus and another half go to the new building in Lake Nona. Right. The VA hospital has agreed to um, build a hospital in Orlando and it'll be in, in um, Lake Nona. The Burnham Institute, which is a 100% research institute in San Diego, they're building, they broke ground, I think two, um, not so long ago, they broke ground um, there for their building. I'm not sure how large their building is, but they, um, with um, help from the state of Florida, they have uh, $300 million in incentives. They're going to build a, an operations here and hire like three, 30 to 300 you know, researchers. University of Florida wants to have a presence down there. MD Anderson Cancer Center Orlando wants to um, have a building there and is negotiating with um, UCF to maybe use some of our building space until they get their building set. So there's going to be at least four to five different um, community and new research organizations out there. So only good things can happen. It's good mm -hmm. for our community. It's good for our students. Um, so many more opportunities. I mean, you've made so much happen without this substantial medical community mm -hmm. tied to UCF. So I can only imagine what great things you and other researchers like you, and even many of us in psychology, see so many ties to the new medical school and all of the associated facilities. I think it is going to be really neat for Central Florida. Yeah, it's going to take a long, long time to develop because I mm -hmm. came from, and you, USF has a medical school. Mm -hmm. And were you part of the medical school? Is that where? No, it we was were basic? completely, we borrowed their library on occasion, but okay. no, we had really very little affiliation. I think UCF really values interdisciplinary work though. And that so I would true. imagine we're going to see a lot of cross between departments and uh, traditionally non-medical units wanting to participate in, mm -hmm. in all that's going on there. I think they're going to have to because, I mean, we're starting so late with our medical school. I mm -hmm. mean, when I was in my uh, University of Miami for, as a technician for a long time, well, not for a short time, and then as a graduate student and then as a postdoc, so I was in this medical environment for 11 years, and it's an amazing operation to build and to keep going. And we're starting, and medical school is for a, a lot of the income. There's two sources of income for medical school. One is the clinical revenue, and one is the uh, overhead off of federal research grants. And those are very important. And the Burnham Institute is, is operated mostly through overhead from federal research grants. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the institutions, um, research institutes, have a policy where the scientists pay their own salary. Um, that's one of the things, nice things about being uh, in a state university is that we're, they value teaching mm -hmm. and we have a teaching mission and we're paid to teach as well as do the research. So we're starting this brand new medical school when the, you know, the federal coffers for you know, research are kind of depleted. So it's really tough to get federal grants and um, so, and right now, we're, the clinical revenue isn't going to be there right away. So we're going to need a lot of community help, a lot of state help mm -hmm. to get both medical schools started because the state also approved a medical school at, in Miami at Florida International University. Right. And they have the University of Miami not too far away, and they have University of Miami opened a, I think it's a second medical school with Florida Atlantic University. So it used to be that they only helped teach the first two years of medical school. And I'm not sure if that's still the arrangement they have. But the state, you know, medical schools are very expensive to start mm -hmm. and run and keep going. And develop that reputation. And it seems to me like it's going to draw professionals like you who have a sense of vision. You came to UCF, not really sure about what that was going to turn out to be like. and it's Pioneers. <laughs> the, yeah, pioneers and drawing people who aren't looking to be part of some known entity with a national reputation mm -hmm. of excellence, but to be part of building that and making it happen. Right. So it could I be exciting. That's the pioneering spirit of the first dean of the medical school, Dr. Dr. Deborah German. She's just a wonderful person. She's come in and there's nothing she can't do. I've been amazed. Uh, I've met her a number of times and I've seen what she's been able to accomplish within the first six weeks she was here. 
And I just have to like, you know, applaud her over and over again because to come into a university where they don't quite understand what it is right. <laughs> to, to build the medical school, but they know they want it. And right. It's a great goal to have. But if you actually knew what you were getting yourself into, you know, sane people might say, no, we don't want to go there. But it's like, it's like that in, in science, too. If you think you know everything or if you know what the path is going to be, you may not get into it. You just have to go because you have a passion for it or you think this is helpful for the community. And it really is. Orlando is such a big city. To have, you know, world, eventually world-class health care and, and medical education, not that we don't have world-class health care, we do, but that education component right. where you're always on the leading edge instead of following you're at the leading edge. That's mm -hmm. something that will come about because of the medical city. And when you talk about being on the leading edge, and I try to picture your lab and working with your students, you now I always joke in my lab sometimes, like it's not like we're trying to cure cancer here, but you are. Yeah, we are. <laughs> so what, what's that like in your lab working? What kind of people are drawn to Schwann Cell Research? Hmm, good question. Um, I like the connection with the, the community because it's very easy to be in your lab doing research and it's all about you know publishing the paper you know and making sure you make assistant from assistant to associate professor it's all about you and your career and then it's about their students and their career but what I learned working at the Miami Project to paralysis is that if you can see the face of the people you're gonna help mm -hmm. it really inspires you to go back in the lab after a bad day and keep working so there we had um, the uh, spinal cord injured individuals were there in their wheelchairs and the families come in and at first they're devastated by the loss and, uh, mm -hmm. and the injury. But then they, they develop this inner sense of, I wouldn't say acceptance, but they, they kind of realize what life is all about. They value it and they're determined to make things better. Mm -hmm. So they have this just a sense, and you see their urgency too, and you're like, you know, you walk outside your lab and there they are saying hi, and you get to know them all, and you're like, I have to work hard for them. Mm -hmm. I need to really focus, not on me, but focus on why I'm doing this. And if I can't get excited about that, then I'm in the wrong field and I better go, you know, change fields. Mm -hmm. so, Having that real face attached to yeah. what could be very theoretical and, uh, Disconnected from right, the, the ivory tower the with all the right. you know smart people sitting there and you know right. thinking thoughts. But when I get to when I go to these quarterly board meetings and you know all the moms and dads and grandmas mm -hmm. and the kids are there and you're like okay, this is what I need to do. Mm -hmm. So then you're able to go back and to the lab and you realize you have a responsibility to educate your students so they can get a good job afterwards. So they can. And not even get a good job, it's so they can find where they need to be in life. So I'm just graduating my first PhD student, um, Courtney, and she'll be with me for about five years. And there's something that happens, I'm not sure if you experience this, I know I experienced it as a PhD student. At about third year, you know, mark in time, mm -hmm. you're like, I've had enough, <laughs> I know enough, I want to finish, I want to graduate, I just want to leave. And at about three years, I think, you know how to manipulate your system, you have basic information, but you haven't quite matured. There's a certain amount of, you have to learn, you have all this data, you mm -hmm. have to learn how to analyze it, assemble it into a story, write it, and then you, there's a certain, your brain just takes that long. For most people, it does take four to five years. Mm -hmm. So um, at three years, we had this meeting where we were like, oh, we're not getting along. But after that, I'm so pleased to say that we've been able to um, go beyond that. And she's produced some really nice work. And I just kept saying, you just have to do what you really want to do and what's best for you. Don't worry about everything else. Don't worry about how long so-and-so stayed in the program right. or someone got out before me and they only mm -hmm. produced one paper. It's not about comparing yourself to everybody else, which is what I was always told when I was a postdoc by Mary Bungie. Um, it's all about where do you want to go in your life? What kind of life do you want to live? Mm -hmm. And if you're going to stay in academic science, 
you might need more rigor than if you're going to go and teach high school, which is teaching high school is a very important job. Mm -hmm. And if you can bring passion about your science to the high school students, then you're going to change their lives. So maybe, you know, the student that got out with one paper, which you can't do anymore. We have, you know, program, programmatic standards. But there's always the quality of paper. You know, it's just the, you know, right. quantity versus quality. We all want to publish lots of papers, but how good are those papers? And so... It sounds like you really, you clearly have passion for the research. And what's neat is I hear an equal excitement or passion for mentoring and teaching and it's so easy to get caught up in our own research and where we want our research to go but to really recognize our important role in helping to nurture and raise mm -hmm. these other future researchers, teachers, parents. And one of my students Just said to me almost as a secret, I think I'm going to go clinical, like be a therapist. Mm -hmm.